1927, there was a total eclipse of the sun visible in Great Britain, and in the film which we took at the time, the phenomenon appeared like this. Astronomers promised us a repeat performance in 1999, but we decided not to wait, so we took the next best thing, a partial eclipse in 1936. Our cameraman went to Stonehenge, which is a very good spot to be in a thunderstorm just before the dawn, but he was rewarded with some magnificent pictures. Here is the first phase of the eclipse, about 5.15 a.m. At 5.22, clouds streaked across the sun, much to the annoyance of the astronomers, although to the layman, these clouds enhanced the beauty of the spectacle. This is a very highbrow subject, and I'm afraid I haven't been very astronomical, but even if I did know what it was all about, I wouldn't tell you, you wouldn't understand. Stonehenge, a temple whose gods are forgotten, but whose stones still stand, where men dragged them thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago. Explorers of the English countryside. More than 150 riders are taking part in a 100-mile jaunt from various parts of England converging on Stonehenge. They're keeping away from the main road and traffic, ambling along the dark of the Roman roads and leafy byways, drinking in the glory of summer in the country. What a grand idea for a holiday. The people who put up Stonehenge came from a time before people could read and write, and really this is one of the big mysteries about Stonehenge, how they came later on to have a mathematical, geometrical, astronomical knowledge which seems quite beyond the 
conceptions of primitive and barbarian people. Is it just possible that people in those times somehow knew how to tap the electromagnetic anomalies that are in these stones and use them in their healing? Is it perhaps also possible that they used it, as birds do, and as dogs seem to, in telepathy? They could find their way by these stones. They could perhaps communicate from one stone to another. They were like a giant psychic grid, which could be used for telepathic purposes. Some 385 BC, at about the same time as the first pyramids were being built past Amesbury and Salisbury. The first stone structure was built here at Stonehenge. 2,600 or so blue stones were transported from the Priscelli Mountains in West South Wales, 80 miles away. They were probably dragged down to this and brought up. Then, somehow, they were carried a considerable distance overland, loaded onto huge kilometers. That's 200 at about the same time as the first pyramids were being built at Stonehenge. into shadowy relief the giant pillars of Stonehenge, the successors of the ancient druids await the first rays of midsummer sun. An uninvited guest, prompted by instinct, takes his departure. Legend has it that as the first rays cast the shadow of the Healy Stone across the altar, the knife was plunged into the human sacrifice. <laughs> Patient sun worshippers, after an all-night vigil, see the chief druid conduct the symbolic ritual, which acclaims the longest day. No sacrifice is offered, no blood is spilled upon the altar stone, but it takes the full warmth of a late rising sun to dispel the air of brooding mystery which hangs over the temple of the druids. But three hours after dawn, the hippies were finally allowed up to the site itself, holding their own rituals. and finally linking arms around the stones. As hippies later complied with an eviction order from their main camp, police expressed their satisfaction at their behavior. But with the dawn itself, the Druids' five-year-old ceremony at Stonehenge got underway in earnest. Bow, spirit, and hear us now. Confirm us the But down at the police lines, more hippies were trying to get through to what some call their temple and were inevitably arrested. Vampires of the Royal Air Force were taking part in ground attack and tragedy occurred when one of them exploded and crashed near Stonehenge. Pilot officer Saunders, son of Air Chief Marshal Saunders, losing his life. Of England's uh, establishment at the end of the street, and they don't see any reason at all to be 
some uh, present day legal piece of paper why they should be prevented from pursuing any right to celebrate the Olympics. A lot of people when there's a year and there's some Stonehenge to Stonehenge, babies born from that year are named at the solstice. And my bed was born last year, I was hoping to name him after during the solstice. Shepherded by police, several hundred hippies were finally allowed to leave their camp for the eight-mile walk to Stonehenge just after midnight. Were kept down on the public road, some way from the stones themselves. As druids appeared for their ritual just before dawn, a few frustrated hippies broke through police lines to get closer to the site, and the first of the morning's arrests were made. They readied themselves. A clump of earth found its mark. A fence post luckily did not. You must disperse or police officers will make arrests. 3,000 year old Stonehenge and a gathering of teenagers out to make a night of it and dig those druids. These weirdies become these druids came to Stonehenge to beat the sunrise on the year's longest day. Pick on Stonehenge, there's no evidence that this ancient place was ever a druid temple. Even so, they keep on coming, and they've never had it so tough as this year. Come on, make with the horn, Daddy O! Just before four o'clock, some hippies scaled the heelstone. Police moved in to disperse the crowd, reckoned now to be about 3,000 strong. There were running skirmishes all around. Police formed lines to split up the crowd. The druids, meanwhile, continued their solstice ceremonies at the occupied heelstone. They marched the hippies away from Stonehenge, arguments all the way. The remaining resistors chased across the fields, dawn gone, the battle lost. So what had gone wrong? I could have stopped them one and a half miles away, and I thought it was right to let them come and, and be present when the sun rises over the stones. They come and they can't behave themselves. The peacemakers among them, though, were simply brushed aside. For a few, this seemed to be what they'd come for. They can't even have hoped to win. Some got through to taunt the police, some tried and didn't make it. Most of them didn't even try. Get those who are absolutely passive, they sit on the road, they've got very little interest in anything that's going on around. And then you've got um, a, a sort of middle group who've been followed by two. But in the midst of it, and we've experienced now in the West Country for a number of years, you've got this hardcore of people who are prepared to use violence. But disciplined force faced down even that hardcore. They were surly but the fight had gone out of them. Four thousand hippies had been turned back from the stones once again. Fuck off! 
the standing there, if they're right shield saying, go for it, go for it, go for it, you know, come on, come on, provoking us, you know, when people wound up, what do you expect? There are a number of theories as to whether there is any reality to legends about the magic power of megaliths. And perhaps the one which has been most widely written about is that the whole of Britain is crisscrossed with a network of invisible straight lines called ley lines. These are supposed to link all ancient sacred sites like some unimaginably complicated spider's web. And the stones, all the site, burial mounds, tombs, they're supposed to have been put on certain key places which were chosen because they had some kind of power. It is known that underneath the tombs around the static stone, there are anomalies in the Earth's magnetic field. I'm convinced that Stonehenge was an astronomical observatory and was also used as a computer for following the movement of the moon around the horizon. In my estimation, Stonehenge should be rated as the eighth wonder of the ancient world. There's been a lot of speculation about the astronomy at Stonehenge uh, for a long time. And uh, I felt that it was an observatory without thinking too deeply about it. I was rather surprised to find that no detailed astronomical calculations had been made. And so perhaps for the first time, I as an astronomer began to calculate all of the possibilities in the archways and stone holes at the site. Who built Stonehenge, Professor? Well, as far as we know, it was built by the local barbarian population of this part of the world. How could barbarians build something like this? Well, barbarians are savages. Uh, they're not civilized either, in the sense that they don't live in cities. But uh, barbarians are people who do have skills, like these people, in, in the importation of raw materials from distant places. They were clearly capable of doing this kind of thing. But this must have had an architect. Now, I'm sure there was an architect. This is one of the very few prehistoric monuments in Europe where you can be sure that somebody who was a real architect in the modern sense of the word uh, had a hand in the job. And, well, do you think that he was a Briton or that he came here from somewhere else? I think it's far more probable that he came from outside, probably from the Mycenaean world in Greece. And perhaps from the Mediterranean. Well, were they the same <coughs> time than uh, the Britons? Very much more so. People living in towns with all the specialization of labor and supplies, finished goods and so on, which is associated with town life. Are there any other indications of this Mediterranean influence you suspect? Well, there's one right behind you, which uh, a good many of us, at any rate, believe to be a representation of an actual Mycenaean dagger. The shaft graves, the burial places of the ancestors of Agamemnon. Agamemnon, the kind of dagger which has been found in the royal tombs of Mycenae. But isn't this Mediterranean influence uh, a fairly recent concept? And that dagger's been there for, for 40 years. Yes, but it was only found uh, in 1953, quite by accident, when we were photographing on a model, a model on the same stone. Professor Atkinson, you've given us a good idea of when Stonehenge was built, and of who built it, and of how it was built. But, but, why was it built? I think this is the one question you that you really can't hope to answer. This is the great mystery of Stonehenge, and I think it will always be a mystery. You can't really answer the question why things were done. Archaeology doesn't deal in human motives. I think everybody is more or less agreed that Stonehenge was a temple, but having said that, you really said all that you can about the why of it. When you're dealing with prehistory, you have to deal with the work of men's hands. But you can't get at their minds. When you reach for their minds, they slip through your fingers. They were not the sort of people who were capable of thinking out something pretty complex of this kind. After all, the lifespan of these people was a great deal shorter than our own. It's very doubtful whether, on the average, anyone would live long enough to observe even one complete cycle. And clearly you must observe and record several cycles before you can be sure that there's a cycle at all. There are simply 56 holes in the ground, equally spaced in a circle, 
about 16 feet apart, and, and this is important, I think, for Professor Hawkins's theory, they were filled up almost as soon as they'd been dug and dug. Now, he suggests that these were used as markers in a kind of computer over a long period of time, and dug. And my objection to this, it's a purely practical one, is that if you want to set out 56 marks on the ground, it isn't the best way of doing it to dig a lot of holes and then fill them up again when the Aubrey holes, I think, were completely grown over and probably didn't show on the surface at all and dug. You wouldn't recognize it in a, as an observatory. The modern observatories have telescopes and domes. The ancient Britons uh, worked with the only material they had, which was stone. These stones are set in very definite positions. They mark the rising and setting of the sun and moon through the year. And in fact, the precision with which these stones are set uh, is remarkable. I doubt whether we could do it today without a lot of careful surveying. And uh, by following the sun and the moon, they could regulate their calendar. They could follow the year. And what is more important, I'm sure that they could predict eclipses with this. It's uh, an instrument for following the mo motion of the sun and the moon so carefully that you could even predict eclipses. These people were what I would call howling barbarians. They were practically savages. And everything else we know about them suggests that they were quite incapable of this degree of scientific and technological sophistication. When you read people describing them as barbarians or howling barbarians, this is just a, a wrong conception of them altogether. I think I'd put it this way, that the people of the time of Stonehenge were not only skilled in working stone, they were people who could uh, travel by sea from the East Mediterranean up into Britain. They therefore must have been good navigators, good shipbuilders. I think they were very intelligent. The archaeologists don't know this, and they don't know that. But by some mysterious reason, they do seem to know that the Druids had nothing to do with Stonehenge. How they reconcile these two facts, I wouldn't know. The Druids go right back into the mists of time. And according to our traditions, the Druids built Stonehenge. We're not asking anybody to believe this, and we don't care whether the statement is accepted or not. That is our tradition and according to our records. We believe that the Druids own Stonehenge as representatives of the people. Is it peace? It is peace. Is it peace? Peace. Arise, O sun. Let the darkness of night fade in the beams of thy glorious light. My own feeling is that Stonehenge is un undeniably a computer, which I think Professor Hawkins's case is absolutely clear here. You could regard Stonehenge as a way of making predictions of an astronomical kind. The whole question, of course, really is whether it was designed as such. This is much more difficult to answer, and this remains the $64 question, if you like. But one thing I think we must be absolutely clear about, when we use a word like computer in this context, we mean a huge electronic digital system which are used all over the world today. Midsummer, 1964. At Stonehenge, the forecast is fog. It was cold and damp as we set up our cameras to try to capture the visual evidence that could confirm Professor Hawkins's theory. Up to now, that theory existed only on paper. Dr. Hawkins told us that one picture of the sunrise was all he needed to prove his calculations once and for all. It's a rare morning on Salisbury Plain when the rising sun is not hidden in mist. 
If it is hidden this morning, Professor Hawkins' theory remains only a theory. But if the sun is visible rising over the heelstone, the 24 alignments keyed to it will each fall into place. If the sun is not visible or is wide of the heelstone, the alignments are meaningless figures on paper. This experiment was filmed exactly as it took place. Our cameras are set to precise specifications dead center on the Stonehenge axis. And thus, we are now part of a countdown that began 4,000 years ago. Stonehenge man stood here then, tense, expectant, waiting for a god that brought warmth and fertility and life. Now we wait for a door to the past to open for a fresh insight into the mind of prehistoric man. The sun does rise over the heelstone. Folklore is now fact. Tradition is translated into science. And for the first time, documented on motion picture film. Based on this experiment, Dr. Hawkins has discovered that his calculations were exact to within one-tenth of a degree. There seems little doubt that Stonehenge was an observatory. Professor Atkinson, while still questioning the idea that Stonehenge was used as a computer to predict eclipses, does credit Hawkins with a new and valuable scientific contribution. Even Dr. Hawkins would agree that we do not yet know the full story. And the search for Stonehenge truth continues. sites which evoke such a sense of awe and mystery. The theories behind the standing stones range from the seemingly logical to the mystical and bizarre. Stonehenge was built in three stages between 3150 and 50 BC, and although similar structures can be found elsewhere in Europe, it's unique because of the precision of its architecture. The most widely accepted theory is that it was built as some sort of temple. I drove to the toilet, I thought I had given birth. To myself, I really did, I call our glory. We came here as the Southern Druids with invited tickets to come to see the stones. We came up here very nicely and asked a lot of people 
and got very short chains and told that we couldn't come in. They were breaking and we all got into the stones where we carried out a druid wedding and then we were surrounded by police. A special patrol group charged in, took out about 20 people very heavily, a lot of people were getting kicked and beaten up. We walk carefully and quietly away from the stones because we feel the stones are a place of peace. I'm an older generation person. I can remember coming to these stones when you could walk in, no fences, freedom for everybody. People don't want to abuse these stones, they're too important. Well, good morning from the centre of Stonehenge, a spot where very few people are allowed to tread these days, especially on June the 21st, the summer solstice. The English Heritage, which runs the site, has said that this year, a select few from several groups will be allowed into the centre, onto what is for them sacred ground. year-old Stonehenge on its most witching night of the year, the Midsummer Solstice. There's no evidence that Stonehenge was ever a Druid temple, but that doesn't stop the modern Druids coming here to celebrate. The offbeat event attracted a more than offbeat crowd of spectators. Guard dogs and barbed wire kept the audience at its distance. Among the strange standing stones, the Druidical ceremony went on. stripped off and made with the Tarzan Act. The things that turn some people on. For a while, the 2,000 strong guards took over the ceremony, and the small group of police were unable to control them. Maintaining their dignity, the Druids continued with their service, and as the dawn came, they retired. This is a traditional ceremony, but unfortunately the Yobbo interruptions are becoming traditional too. spiritual leader Bill Wally Russell, thousands of people representing Britain's alternative youth subculture flocked to the Stonehenge People's Free Festival. Flocked to the Stonehenge People's Free Festival. Flocked to the Stonehenge People's Free Festival.
Queen. And hey, boys and girls, all the power of Tango. The Druids have left, the hippies arrive, and for one day of the year, officialdom forgets that no one's allowed within the stones. The mystery of Stonehenge is open to all. Perry the Bride arrives on horseback. Rick the Vic should have conducted the wedding, but he's in hospital, taken ill with jaundice as he trudged the symbolic path from the pre-Christian White Horse at Uffington in Oxfordshire to Stonehenge. But in Sid Rawl, the Black Valley has perhaps the unofficial leader of the country's hippies. His congregation, admittedly with a lot of help from cannabis, drink in what for them is the almost mystical significance of the stones. The hippie society, alternative though it might be, has recognised and borrowed the need to bring people and families together for thanksgiving and worship, however eccentric. With Stonehenge, their church, they hold high the newborn children and dedicate them not in God's name, but in the name of the universe. Sun after storm, sun. <laughs> Baptism has no recognition outside the stones or throng of hippies. Neither will Stephen Perry's wedding. It's not sanctioned by the state and has no claim to be other than a simple declaration of love. But Stonehenge is for remembrance as well as celebration. It commemorates Phil Russell, who started the festival seven years ago. His followers call themselves Wallies after the name he adopted, Wally Hope. Wally Hope.
Well, yes, he was lovely and sexual and stroked. Because it was on a site where everyone was out of their heads, he didn't feel paranoid when he took it. But one of the most common paranoias when you, if you're a person who hasn't experienced before and you take something like LSD, is when you're out of your head, you think, fuck me, I'm out of my head. Everyone else is straight and they're all looking at me. And you get scared because you feel that you're on your own because everyone else is not as you are and you are the only person who's like that. But when you see at Stonehenge that there's like, like 50,000 people all tripping and completely fucked out of their heads, it makes you feel safe and a part of it so you can get as tripped out as you like and you don't feel scared of, of, of being alone and just the only man one there. Lucy and everybody aboard it took far too many drugs and blah 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 150 police officers were moved into the area this morning. They'll be on duty 24 hours a day. The hippies towards Stonehenge is now thought to be imminent. Ministry of Defense police have mounted guard around the military firing range which skirts the side of the camp. They've warned the hippies of the dangers of crossing the range, but they're still taking every precaution in case an attempt is made. Observation points equipped with special night sights have been set up to spot any movement by the hippies under cover of darkness. The army has dug trenches and thrown up earth barricades across the country tracks leading towards the Stonehenge area. Army patrols around Salisbury Plain are much more in evidence than normal, skirting the fringes of the range. The chief constable has said he's determined to prevent any mass trespass in the area by the hippies. But they've been planning exactly how they'll avoid the barriers the police and the army have put in their way. Extra coils of barbed wire have been placed around Stonehenge today. It's thought any mass movement towards the site will be on foot across the fields tonight. David Chater, ITN, Stonehenge. The police have laid their plans well to keep the hippies from celebrating tomorrow's summer solstice in Stonehenge. As dawn rose, the largest colony of hippies, some 350 of them, just a few miles away from the stones, the possession borders were served on the site. Negotiations with the police failed, and the hippie convoy took to the road again, with every step being monitored. They were still determined to make the same end, the police were equally determined to keep them out, and just three miles into their trek, the police closed the trap. A roadblock was set up, police reinforcements drawn across the road, and once more, tensions rose. You are instructed now to disperse immediately. The so now they've called a quick cooling off period for 10 minutes while both sides reconsider their positions. 
but the police eventually decided the time for talking was over. Several hundred of them moved into the convoy to clear the carriageway. More than 100 arrests were made, including those who only a few minutes before had been trying to negotiate with the police. Some attempted to flee across the fields, but were soon apprehended. The police, it seems, have finally put an end to the hippies' hopes of celebrating the solstice at Stonehenge. The Druids had Stonehenge virtually to themselves today as dawn began to break on the longest day. Lines of police controlled all movement in and out of the area. Anyone making a break for the stones were quickly snapped up. The Druids, denied access to the stones, had to conduct their ancient ceremonies on the A344. Modern historians snootly dismiss the supposed connection between the Druids and Stonehenge, but the site does have a special significance for the order. They used to be the learned class among the ancient Celts and seemed to have frequented oak forests. Small bands of hippies were allowed through the lines to watch the ceremonies, despite the arrest of more than 200 of their convoy colleagues yesterday. They appeared disconsolate, but their spirits seemed to rise with the sun. There's only 22 people been arrested for coming anywhere near the stones. Do you see what I mean? It's not a threat at all to anybody, is it, really? Authorities fear that large gatherings of revellers could result in damage to the stones. So on the solstice, no one is allowed within four miles of the circle, except the police. of the summer solstice converged on a field opposite Stonehenge. Okay, we're going to talk their to goal to reach their sacred site for a ceremony among the stones. But lines of police and a representative I, of English I, I, heritage honest, barred I'm their way. But because of the, the absolute uh, um, uh, sort of tragedy this morning, um, English heritage have taken a decision that there can be no further access. This is the reason why Stonehenge is now off limits. An invasion of 200 travellers who rushed onto the site, clashing with police, some climbing onto the stones, refusing to come down. Officers in riot gear were taunted by some travellers who'd been drinking heavily. 23 people were arrested for a variety of public order offences. The result is a ban on further access. This is as close as the solstice worshippers can come. And while this is an entirely peaceful ceremony, uh, the police say they will be here in force throughout the night uh, to ensure that no one gets any closer to the stones. It's a frustrating decision for the Druids who've negotiated for years to gain access to the site. It seems they'll have to wait for the next millennium. Oh, I'm going crazy! I got you! 
15 years of absolute shite, including beating crap out of people at the beanfield, and everything that's gone after that. Suppression, oppression, and all the other oppressions you could possibly imagine. To stop this happening, which is great, and really fun. That's it.
the people who built Stonehenge would think of it all, who can tell? <laughs>